uh, uh, dojo. And uh, um, when he when he died, he was uh, uh, what they call a rokudan belt. That's a six don six six class black belt. And uh, um, he I mean he really kind of left a kind of a legend in the um, the judo community because he uh, um, he was the judo chairman of um, I think it's Southern California. Um, so sports and the family, you know, we yeah, you know, we just like to stay outside and and do sports and run around and get in the dirt and <laughs> have fun. Computer? No computers. <laughs> no computers. Oh my gosh. And we only had one TV. <laughs> so we had to be outside. <laughs> and the kids were the remote. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You were a kid. Oh, your dad would yell, "Change oh, channel." <laughs> we weren't very long on family, uh, I don't know, activities so much as we uh, we traveled quite a bit. But some of my special interests uh, when I got here is I really got involved in scouting. I liked it. I liked going to Camp Emerson, Idlewild. I liked advancing through the ranks. Uh, I was the first scout in Riverside County Council to get the mile swim which was neat when it came out. That was done the old Corona plunge. Can't touch the bottom, can't touch the sides, swim a mile. Wow. A lot of lap to go a mile, that old plunge. But I got that, became an Eagle Scout, got to go to uh, Philmont, which was nice. I, I enjoyed the outdoors, camping. Uh, I raised my family camping, uh, my kids, it, it was neat. But always outdoor stuff is primary my interest, and firearms. We had a range on our property, and I'm still into firearms, which is kind of nice. So, like Jimmy, I'm dangerous. So, <laughs> it's legal. You know. uh, it's just neat. It was always family activities. Family is the most important thing for us. The neighborhood I grew up in, it was all boys. There were three girls, and that was it. Just three girls. We used to all play football together. Well, when us young ladies started maturing into young ladies, the guys weren't after the football anymore. And our mothers said to the girls, I don't think you guys better play football with them anymore. So that was my short football career. Um, I loved to read, and I loved to read as a child. And I took piano lessons for I have no idea how many years, but I belonged to the Women's Improvement Club, and they have a beautiful baby grand piano. And every time I look at that, I can picture myself as a young child playing on that piano because my piano teacher would rent out the Women's Improvement Club for our recitals every year. So I look at that piano and think of all the times that I sweated and, and was worried and figured I was going to forget it. So anyway, uh, the other thing too was baseball. When I was in high school, I lettered in baseball. And my girls look at me now and go, you lettered in baseball? But I did. Well, my favorite sport in high school was baseball also. I loved playing catcher because I didn't like running. <laughs> <laughs> and I was pretty good at it too. And later, I got into fishing. And we would go camping every year to Utah and spend all three weeks. And I got to fish till my heart was content, I'll tell you. But it was fun. And we always went as a family. And we went also dune buggies and motorcycles and all this stuff. So we had a big ram for my son to enjoy. And we all enjoyed it, too. And now he's doing the same with his daughter. Only he's taking... He's not taking the rub scout. <laughs> He's taking her to Europe so she can see everything. <laughs> but anyway, one of these days, Nana's going to take her fishing, though, and she's going to love it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Next question, we're going to jump into high school. In high school, was there a teacher who influenced, was there one teacher who influenced you the most, and who was it and why? Did you skip a question? I did. All right, just testing you. <laughs> I have to say it was, um, I spent a lot of time on the baseball field, and so I would have to say it would be uh, Coach Wilkerson, who happens to be sitting back there. Um, right next to my beautiful wife, Linda. Anyway, he, you know, Coach always told us, you know, you know, you could be winning one minute, and losing the next, you know, so I, a lot of times people would start yelling at the other team and saying stuff. Coach never let us do that because, you know, once, if you're winning and you start ragging on the other team, the next thing you know, you're losing, 
It doesn't look good. So he said, if you're going to do any talking, do it with your bat and your glove. So um, that's, and you know, he coach was just a perfect role model. And he's still a very good friend of mine. I'm trying to think of what teacher influenced me. No one should have that blame on him. Uh, well, that's a tough one for whoever's out there. Um, obviously, there were there were some teachers I really respected, and Coach Wilkerson was one of them. He was a, a just such a good example. He and his wife. Um, I can remember that um, if I was doing something screwy, they were not above straightening me out on that particular thought or action. Um, I, I mentioned another coach, Coach Beals, Jim Beals. Um, he was a wrestling coach and also a PE teacher in high school. He was um, a, a real staunch, uh, strong man. That was a good example to, the, to pay attention to. And if you didn't, he would get your attention. Um, but actually to think of, of someone who really... Wait, it just came to me. Gene Lowry. I had him for a general math class. The one thing I remember that he, I don't know how I remember this, um, but he, he made reference to the fact that uh, as you go into your working life as an adult, um, you're going to make X number of dollars. And he goes, never be ashamed to tell someone how much you make. And I went into public uh, employment, so guess what? It was known anyway. <laughs> Well, I didn't really have a favorite teacher, but I respected all of them, and they've all and they've all given me something, you know, uh, to take through life. And so, but I can't really say one particular. Two teachers really stand out in my mind. Uh, one was coach and uh, vocation teacher Rob Fritz. God rest his soul. Everybody liked Fritz. Uh, awesome man. I liked him because he taught me integrity. He meant what he said. He said what he meant. He was an ally. He believed in every one of us individually. If you had a problem, you could talk to Coach Fritz. He was an awesome man. Another one that I really admire, I don't know where he is, whatever happened to him, was Dan Bachman, who was the art teacher, creative, absolutely the zaniest man on the face of this planet. <laughs> he taught me to open my mind and think outside the box. And I hope he's well, but I don't know what happened to Mr. Bachman. He's gone. I'm sorry to hear it. Okay, I don't know how many of you in this room went to Corona High, but there was a teacher there that she was a character, Mrs. Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> she taught home economics, and she stuck in my mind, and when I went away to college, home economics had changed into child development. And I taught for Head Start for 10 years, and I went from Head Start because I kept going to school, and then I taught for Riverside Community College. And Carol Salgado's in this room right now, and she was one of my instructors at, at uh, Riverside Community College. And just about the time she retired, I came on board to Riverside Community College, so that's where I spent the, the last part of my career. But like I say, Mrs. Arnold was a character. Uh, I was looking at my yearbook that I brought today, and I was pointing out to my daughter who's sitting in here. There was a coach, or not a coach, a teacher that taught biology. I know his first name was Norman, but I can't remember what his name is. Towers. I have to, Norman Towers. Towers? Anyway, it was his first year of teaching when I had him for biology, and every time he had explain reproduction, he would turn bright red. <laughs> well, my favorite teacher in high school was Mrs. Doss. She was always there for us girls. She just loved us and, and would help us in any way and listen to us and everything. And then the guy that taught me how to drive was Mr. Polly. He was a uh, the guy that he was in charge of, I think, uh, woodwork or something, that he did this after school. So back then, you got driving his ed after school for free. For free. And so Mr. Polly was my driver, and we talked and talked. And he had a twin, and I have a twin. So we both compared notes of how twins act and dislike each other sometimes. <laughs> but. Anyway, and Mrs. Dawson was always there. I just really liked her a lot. And Mrs. Hicks was just as good as she was. Remember her? Yeah. 
anyway, we had, we were lucky. We had good teachers. I I felt they were all good, so I never had a problem with them. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Outstanding. We don't have any children in the room, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. The good stuff. All right. We'll ask this question. In high school, or no, I'm sorry. Uh, what was a typical Saturday night night like as a high school student? Well, first of all, I'd get my best T-shirt, my nicest jeans, my cleanest tennis shoes, and then we'd drive down to uh, either Doreen or Schnitzel, you know, Dal Taco or Burger Chef, and maybe meet up with my buddy Jack Sherman, who happens to be back there. And, and then we'd hang around and sit around looking at everybody drive by, then all of a sudden we said, Let's get in the, let's go for a drive. So we drive down Sixth Street all the way to the Colony Kitchen, turn around and come back, park again and watch people drive by, hang out, talk, go for another cruise, go down to the Colony Kitchen, turn around. You know, you'd always run into somebody doing the same thing you're doing, so you might want to do a little bit of racing down Sixth Street without getting caught. But that was pretty much a typical uh, uh, weekend when I was in high school, unless somebody's parents were gone and they'd have a party. <laughs> and so, you know, as long as it wasn't at my house, it was it was okay. <laughs> at that time, uh, there wasn't a lot to do in Corona on a Saturday night for kids. Uh, he pretty well covered it all. <laughs> uh, the other thing was, well, obviously you would... Uh, you go to the movies if, if you had someone to go to the movies with. Um, Forgot that part. Okay, just checking. But the the um, other thing, he mentioned the parties, and um, you have those going on. And it just came to my mind, my brother, um, who was a few years younger than me, he w was going to Norco Junior High or High School, at the high school, and... Um, Someone's parents were away, and he had left a note in a book that he left in a classroom that was describing the events to come up in this party on the weekend. There was beer involved with this one. And, um, uh, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Ramirez was the vice principal of the principal, and one of his younger brothers was involved in this deal, so they, they all got popped behind that, uh, that little miscue on my brother's part. But obviously that was the, uh, the parties were the other sidelight to your weekend experiences. Um, in high school, um, I started going with my husband, Jerry Gunter, at that point. So we were, went together uh, all through high school. Um, so, like, we went to the drive-ins, you know, <laughs> uh, or well, first, we always, we always went to uh, Ponies in Rubido, and we got a grinder. I've never had a grinder before that, right? And, you know, they make their own fresh bread, and I think they're part of Delilah's too, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, we, we take that to the drive-in, in, in, uh, uh, that's the only thing I could think of. There wasn't a lot going on. <laughs> the Saturday nights in high school were awesome. It was either a date night, off to the movies, or the drag races that would start right here on the boulevard. And the old PD, this was a new PD at that time. It was fun to sit here at this intersection, this light, line up to the car next to you. I used to race uh, Roth Rock and uh, a Brewer all the time. Brewer had his little deuce coupe side by side, wind up, just as the light would change, jump off the clutch, light up your tires, then kick the clutch in, hit the brakes, the other guy's already full out, he's gone. Corona PD would be waiting down the block. <laughs> uh, i fire him up, jump off the clutch, go 10 feet, stop, and watch the other guy shoot down the street, and here came Corona. Awesome. Corona PD spent a lot of their time chasing me. My dad was an independent garage owner, always had some kind of car with more horsepower than I should possibly need. I, I liked it. I liked it. Corona PD chased me around the boulevard. I had a, a just a flat out go kart that we built, and I was around the boulevard in traffic. And I said, "There's something wrong with you." So I probably thought I couldn't beat the cops, so I had to join them. Uh, when I was a kid, I don't know how many of you were kids here in Corona. 
the businesses used to give free movie tickets to the kids when their parents would go and get you know do their business with the different businesses. So since my dad had a photography studio, my brother and I ever sat Saturday afternoon were at the movies for free. And I'll never forget when the Shaggy Dog movie came out, the line was literally wrapped around the building because everybody wanted to see the Shaggy Dog. As far as Saturday nights go, like everybody else said, dancing and, and going to the movies and stuff, the movies was a big thing to go to the movies on, on Saturday night. But I remember more Friday nights. Friday nights, football games. After football games, there was usually a dance. If it was a formal dance, then that was on Saturday night. But football games on, um, on Friday nights. I don't know what year of high school I was at. Chino was kind of our rival, and I remember we had to have a police escort in and out of that area when we'd go play them in Chino. And uh, it was just crazy because they, we literally, as soon as the game was over, we had an escort to get us on those buses and to get out of town. So that's what I remember. Well, I used to get with the, have dates and then get with the girls and we'd go to Riverside to Tuxies. Remember Tuxies? Yeah. It was always a good hangout. And uh, I had a 53 Chevy two-door stick shift. And I used to race down Magnolia <laughs> with that thing. And I left a couple people, but most of the time I lost. But anyway, that was fun. So I'm glad I didn't get caught. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I've always liked fast cars, though. Is that what attracted Bob? Yeah. What? What? Is that what attracted Bob? <laughs> so, what attracted Bob is when I was on a date with somebody and he was driving his car behind vassals on the sidewalk, chasing oh. these two boys. So he arrested me and my sister and my girlfriend and took us in for curfew. Then he let us go and then a year later we got married. <laughs> Wow, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> what news event that occurred during high school stands out the most to you? Well, when I was in high school, probably one of the biggest, or a couple of the biggest news events was, of course, the Vietnam War and uh, the assassination of uh, Bobby Kennedy and uh, Martin Luther King. Um, those are the ones that stand out most to me, and that the Kennedy, uh, Bobby Kennedy, was assassinated in '68, and so was uh, Martin Luther King. Oh, regarding the major event, uh, just recently, uh, a fellow that we went to high school with, Bob Cook, who. Uh, uh, later became policeman here and then moved out of town. But he reminded me just yesterday of in high school there had been different sides of, of students who, who uh, discussed the Vietnam War. There was a, a group of students that was against the war and there was a, a group of students that were, was for the war. And in fact um, Bob uh, sent me some copies of uh, an article that they had put in the, the high school newspaper describing their uh, side of the events and there was some controversy between the students. Now I didn't remember that until Bob sent this to me yesterday and it's, um, it, was, it was really pretty involved for the level of a student at that time. Maybe I just didn't realize because I wasn't that bright. But uh, be that as it may, it was uh, really kind of a controversial topic in, at, at that time. Uh, and someone that probably took part in that discussion was uh, Jack back there, Jack Sherman. Jack, didn't you take part in that with Bob? Yeah, so um, that was that was a pretty major event at that time. That's right. In our sophomore year is when uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and so that was. Uh, um, yeah, that was the um, most thing that I remember besides the Vietnam War. Um, it was really tragic. Joanne and I were in the, the same grade. and I would say the big thing uh, that really sticks out is the assassination of JFK. 
I was in geometry class, Mr. Donahue, the principal, came on the PA, and you all remember Mr. Donahue, boys and girls. It sounded so serious, he let us know what had happened. He was absolutely mortified. Everybody lined up at the one pay phone by the office. Parents came and got the kids. Everybody was really traumatized. It was the end of a Camelot. We were young, we were growing up. We were in the prime of our youth. Our whole future was ahead of us, and it got shattered in one day. And we still feel that effect. It's emotional. Uh, Vietnam, of course, the other thing, all of us guys knew either we were going to Vietnam or we weren't. That's the way it was. If we weren't connected, you were going to go. We lost a good dear friend, uh, George Ingalls, our first one in Vietnam, bless his heart. So it was tough, tough times. It was a sobering time. I think those two events probably took a lot of our youth and innocence from us at that time. It made us stronger. It really did. But that was the thing that really stamped out. They mentioned a lot of things. I remember turning on the TV at dinner time, and there was a Vietnam War right on TV every single night. So you had the Vietnam War with your dinner. The assassination, I remember it was either second or third period when the principal came on, and at that time you had just been shot. And I remember at the end of the day, because I was in PE, that we were out on the grass because everybody was just devastated. We didn't get any school done at all that day, at least not the classes I was in. Uh, at the end of the day, they announced over the intercom that he was dead. And that's what I remember from that day was first he was shot and we thought, okay, he'll make it. And then we left that school knowing that he was gone. I remember when President Kennedy was killed, I was working at the drugstore and I couldn't believe it. It was down on, they had already changed downtown. And I was looking out and all of a sudden there's hardly any cars on the road. I think everybody was that devastated about his being killed. And the Vietnam War, I just couldn't get over when they started it. I didn't think they were going to, and then they started it, and it was a total waste. Okay, Excuse me just a second. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to address something that, uh, that Jim mentioned again a minute ago about George Ingalls. George Ingalls graduated in 65. 64. 64. George Ingalls graduated in 64 from Corona, uh, went to Vietnam, and he uh, got killed. He jumped on a grenade that was thrown into their area, and he was later awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, uh, which is, you know, as big as it can get. Um, so I think that's something that would not hurt us to reflect back on. So there you have it. Thank you, Jeff. All right, on a lighter note, what music and or movies did you most enjoy in high school? Ah, uh, the 60s. I mean, what was it to like, you know, we had the British Invasion, you know, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, we had Motown, uh, we had the Beach Boys, Elvis was in there. Uh, it was just the uh, best time to have music. I mean, it was, to me, it was, that's all I listened to in my home. And then the movies we had, we had, uh, there was Bullet, there was The Graduate, there was Cool Hand Luke. I mean, these are all classics. Uh, it, it was just the, the, be the best time to, to grow up. And uh, best music, best movies. I agree. <laughs> the, uh, back then on the radio stations, they, they had a top 40, which included everything from um, Jimi Hendrix, Frank Sinatra, Johnny Cash, all on this, the same um, uh, uh, program. So you might have um, Jimi Hendrix at the top of the heap one week, and the next week uh, Johnny Cash. Uh, Dean Martin was even in there. And so you had such a, we had such a wide array of music to listen to. And now everything's so specialized, uh, if you don't listen to the right, the right station, you miss out on a lot of entertainment. But, um, and I remember on, on my car radio, which is an AM obviously in those days, um, I would typically have, I was an awkward kid, um, I, I, would, I liked D. Martin and that type of music, and, and I like country music, and so, but the other stuff like Steppenwolf, things of that nature, didn't work for me. And so I was somewhat of a little odd. That's way too easy. Don't laugh at that one. Uh, I stuck my chin out on that one. Okay. But anyway, that's kind of was my view of the music in those days. 
Um, I agree. Um, I like the, I mean, <laughs> Do you think I like the end of the story? Uh, no. Um, uh, that period of time, you know, I listened to all types of music. And uh, um, I'm, I'm kind, of, I kind of like the music. You know, like Righteous Brothers, the oh, yeah, Beach Boys, oh, yeah. Beatles, the um, um, uh, Simon and Garfunkel, yeah. And as far as the movies, the movies in the 60s, we still see them over and over today, like Mary Poppins, The Sound of Music, um, and all, of course, all of the uh, uh, Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, oh, John Wayne, so yeah, my husband's a John Wayne fan, yeah. Uh, the Good, Bad, and the Ugly, and all, you know, like I said, all, all uh, Clint Eastwood's. Um, the only thing that I don't like is horror movies. That was the first movie my, my husband took me to on a date. Yeah. He says, well, I was, was it a drive-in? Yes, yes. He says, well, he goes, well, I was thinking maybe you'd get a little closer, you know? I, uh, <laughs> I'll take care of Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, but by the end of the evening, I was like, the advisor was down. Like, ah. To this day, I don't like, I don't really like horror movies. <laughs> um, I guess my husband and I, we've been married for 49 years. I'm still with him now. <laughs> I agree about the uh, music. It was pretty diverse. I lived... On KFXM, this is what I listen to. You know, Five ninety radio. I just, I loved that station. Uh, movies that stick out in my mind. I, I own all of them. Uh, Doctor Zhivago, best movie ever made. Uh, Lars of Arabia. It's got to be number two of all time. And I think you all remember the Blue Map with George Pepard and Ernest Leandris. Those three movies were awesome. I've watched them a million times. Um, I like the pop music. I was, I was a happy guy when I was in. Uh, when I was a sophomore, I was voted Mr. Happy. And ironically, George Ingalls, that same year, was voted Mr. Lucky. I've never, I've never forgotten the irony of that. But it was a happy time. We had happy, happy time, even with the mess of politics and the war. It was just kind of a bitching time to grow up. <laughs> I remember the first time my mother heard me say that. Oh, man, she came unglued. Sorry. Well, how many of you girls really like Elvis. <laughs> I knew that. I knew that. We have a slumber party that was usually the main songs that was being played with Elvis's and we'd all lose weight that night because we were all dancing. Anyway, that was a favorite of mine and I did like the Beach Boys. I listened to them a lot and I still do. I have CDs in my car and I've got some of the old CDs and People get in my car, if they're my age, I play them. If they're not my age, I don't play them. <laughs> I don't make them listen if they don't want to. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, a um, couple more questions. What do you feel were some of the biggest challenges of growing up in Corona? My biggest challenge was my dad. Uh, I... My dad was pretty strict, and when he said I had to be home at a certain time, I better be home at a certain time. I really didn't have problems around town or in school. Uh, it, it, it was just trying to please, you know, I wanted to please my dad and make sure I was there when he said to be home. And it wasn't until I got drafted and went in the Army. Uh, okay, before that, my dad said, where were you? What took you so long? You know, why didn't right you here? Well, when I went in the Army... I remember coming home on leave one time and I went to see some friends uh, that lived here in Corona and I did come home that night. Uh, probably because I couldn't drive home that night. <laughs> and so anyway, I stayed uh, with these friends overnight and then the next day when I showed up, it wasn't my dad saying, where were you? It was my mother. I mean, I was in the army, so you know, it was my mother saying, well, where were you? What were, 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 were you doing? I said, well, I was fell asleep at a friend's house, you know, but yeah, trying to, trying to make sure that I please my folks, that, that was challenging, that was very difficult for me to do, too. I'm thinking of challenges in Corona as I was growing up, um, I, I don't 
don't really feel I really had any great challenges until after I graduated from high school, and then the challenge was the time, the, the time frame we were living in. If you were an 18, 19 year old a guy, you were trying to figure out where your future was going to take you. And if you weren't a particularly good college student, which is kind of a classification I fell into, um, then you you would not get the uh, student deferment from the military, so then you want up getting drafted like Mike did. Uh, but as an 18, 19 year old guy, you're trying to figure out where you're going to go and your future is going to be, and your future is no more than the next year or two to you at that time. And, and so... Uh, we were trying to figure out what to do with our lives in that time in Corona, and some of us were more fortunate than others. I was able to, I was sitting in my apartment where I was living with uh, uh, Jim Towns, and uh, I was reading the newspaper and it said, if you're interested in joining the National Guard, contact Sergeant Gamner at the Corona National Guard Armory in Corona. Now, how I remember that guy's name, I can't tell you. Um, but anyway, as I drove down there and I went in there, th here there was Doug Francois, uh, Danny Sheehy, who graduated in '65, uh, all coming to a screeching halt in the armory, going in and, and signing up and um, joining the National Guard. So that was uh, one way that um, my concerns with my future was alleviated for the next six years. Um, and then I got back from certain things and went to college and all that business. But um, I think it was the times it was the most challenging for me. Well, this is kind of a, I don't know, a kind of a tricky question for me. <clears throat> um, growing up, my family was very lenient with me. And my husband's family was very strict, like, like ours. And so, I don't know if they, they trusted me, um, but um, I really, this is kind of weird, because I never really asked my, my folks or my mom if I could go somewhere. I would just say, well, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to go somewhere. And then I would always come back. Um, and so, it was kind of, it was kind of uh, hard to, for me to get used to my husband's uh, strictness, I guess, raising our kids. Um, and so I, I don't know how, there has to be a happy medium, you know, but I, I take, I am so fortunate that I have uh, grew up with a bunch of great, great kids. And we are still, you know, we're, we're friends to this day. And um, I guess I was just lucky that I had good friends and they had good friends, parents, I guess. I, I didn't see a lot of challenges really growing up in a small town other than everybody knew everybody and if I would do something wrong my dad would know it before I finished doing it wrong. <laughs> uh, it's just the way it was. Uh, one of my more brilliant moves, me and Corona PD and the sheriff got into it one night. One of my hot rod cars and they chased it over the mountain to uh, San Juan Capistrano. It hit the newspaper. My dad took the Corona Daily Independent. His front page news, being the Einstein that I was, I saw the article, cut it out with a pair of scissors, <laughs> and folded the paper back up, put it on dad's desk. You know, well, he wrote all the paper, paper to see what he was missing. That was a real short trip. <laughs> Truly, the biggest challenge here was getting through the Del Taco without the old grouchy lady calling the cops because she didn't like the old car, whatever her name was. And, uh, the fountain over here. Every time it got bubbled over, people asked me if I knew. Well, of course I knew. I did not do it, but I knew who did. And I was always being asked. But I covered a lot of you people that put biz tablets in that fountain. <laughs> My challenge was with dating. Uh, I come from a Hispanic family, and in Mexico, you have to have someone with you when you go out on a date. But we're living in California, we're living in the United States. This doesn't apply to me. Oh, yeah, it did. The first boy that I dated, um, who was also Hispanic, my little brother had to go along on our dates. And finally, he had enough of it. And he said to me, you either get rid of him or I'm not taking you out anymore. So I cried to my mom and she finally let it go. But ironically, my brother, the first girl he dated, who was also Hispanic, they had to take her brother. So it was poetic justice. <laughs> Another thing that happened, how many of you in this room parked up in the groves in Corona? 
I won't tell you what for, but popped up in the girls. Okay. <laughs> My husband and I were in college and we were parked up in the girls one night and we weren't really doing anything, we were just talking. And the next thing we knew, here comes a police car. And my husband had a little Volkswagen bug, and one cop's at his window, and the other cop's at my window, wanting to know what our names are. And one cop knew his family, and the other cop knew my family, and they said, move on. And we did. We were so afraid they were going to tell our parents. Well, my biggest challenge was getting my husband to ask me out on a date. <laughs> Took me a lot of flirting, and then he didn't know I had a twin sister, so he drove by my house one day, and she was out watering, and she was married and expecting a baby. And so he thought I was flirting because I needed to get a father. <laughs> so finally I told him, I said, no, I have a twin sister. And, but she would see him when she was driving my car, and he'd wave at her and stuff. And she'd just stick her nose up and keep driving. You know? <laughs> he thought I was the coldest, hottest person in the world. <laughs> so finally, I got the message to him. Uh, Lieutenant Wade told him that, no, she has a twin sister. And she's married, and she is expecting a baby. So then we finally got to go out on a date. <laughs> that was my biggest challenge. It was the best challenge I ever had. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Well, I think we could all sit here all day and do this, but yeah. we do need to wrap it up. So I would like to ask you, just in about a minute, to just try to summarize growing up in Corona and, uh, and how you characterize that. I loved growing up in Corona. It was, you knew, like somebody mentioned earlier, you knew everybody. It was a fun place to grow up. We had everything. We had the, the, the plunge. We had Little League fields. We had the parks. It, it was, and you had your friends. It, it was just uh, probably one of the best places anybody could have grown up. And and I, st I still live in Corona. Uh, most of my, well, no, some of my children still live here in Corona also. But it, it's just, uh, it's gotten bigger. When I was growing up, there was like 13,000 people. Now there's like 150,000 people here. It's a little bit too crowded for me, but I still love Corona. Yeah, I agree with Mike on, on that. Um, the uh, growing up in Corona was such a great experience for me. Like I mentioned, I came from the LA area, and then I got out here in a much smaller environment, and you got to know everyone so well. You could go anywhere and run into someone you knew. And it was just a, a real warming experience. And I can remember uh, in later years, I, I coming, I'd be uh, on vacation somewhere, and I'd come, be coming back into Corona and be dropping down off the hill on the freeway and looking out over the valley. And it was just such a warming feeling, knowing that, that the community was such a pleasant place to be. Um, and there again, Mike uh, alluded to it, we're at 150,000 people. Now, we don't have that close-knit type of community that we once had. Uh, and there again, we probably don't circulate as much as we once did. <laughs> but that's about it. Um, I think growing up in Corona, East Vale is considered the Corona area, has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Like I, I told you, our friends that uh, we've made, uh, grammar school, junior high, in high school, we are still close with them to, to this day, and um, and I think that that kind of uh, what you know what has made me today uh, is is having such close close and dear friends. Corona was made up then of really hardworking people. We came out to the Black Hills. I didn't know what an orange tree was or a lemon tree. I didn't know what a pine tree was. But I've got all the hard-working people with great family values here. Corona's kind of a settling community where people would commute. There's always kind of a bedroom community, really. But it was a diverse, the diversity of Corona that I really liked. We had it all. We had every shape, size, flavor of person. But the, uh, I think the integrity of Corona is still here. It's a small town. I think uh, all of you said earlier that it's just still a small town, even though it's a big town. It's just a great, stable place to grow up, I thought. 
um, I was born in Riverside, but the rest of my life I was here pretty much until I got married. When I got married, we lived in North Carolina for a while because my husband was in the service, and we lived up in the Bay Area for about three years. But this is always home. I'm glad my girls have experienced this, and now my